All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tim. And uh, thanks to whoever put the slides up. That's convenient, because I usually botch that like I botched my microphone before. Uh, yeah, so with regards to the Philly Sour, uh, you know, when I was trying to come up with new beer styles for the deep dive, I thought like certainly to focus on the ones that we're, we're brewing would be would be helpful. And um, I asked Alex down at the brew pub, there is another Alex, uh, would you believe it, um, whether or not there were any commercial examples that are made with that yeast. And he said there are a few, so I put him on alert. I don't know when he'll have it ready, hopefully before we actually need to brew, but you know, it'd be nice to be able to talk about that yeast and have it, um, some of the flavors in front of us and get a sense of what can be done with it. So I'm working on that. Um, okay, so we're talking about Municalis because it is the beer uh, that we're uh, going to be brewing uh, at some point this year. And of course, it has a history. It's actually got a young history. Municalis, a very light style, as you've been seeing from my video. Uh, it was actually a response to Pilsner beer. Um, so this is Gabriel uh, Settlemeyer II of Spaten. Um, he was the owner of Spaten, second generation Settlemeyer owner um, in Munich, uh, decided that he needed to compete with Pilsner. And there are a lot of beer styles that popped up as competitors to uh, Pilsner. Certainly the Belgian gold nails is one that comes to mind. Kolsch is another. Um, so these are beers that, that are trying to be like Pilsner, uh, but are not Pilsner. They're now a new style. And what's interesting about this guy is that he went into the Munich monasteries where, which were the, really at the time, uh, the only place where, where lager was being brewed outside of Pilsen and stole the yeast. Uh, and so, you know, this is entrepreneurship at its best. Uh, it's well known actually, he wrote in his diary, at least according to Michael Jackson, uh, that he was surprised he didn't get beaten up for it. Um, so, you know, this is a guy who's really after it. And, and he also helped to modernize German brewing because at the time, you know, we're talking about the late industrial revolution in England. And uh, these guys were making beers where they had complete control over temperature and, and specific gravity and water chemistry and that kind of thing. And the German brewers really weren't doing as well. And so he wanted to bring Germany up to snuff. So that great reputation that Germany has really started with Gabriel Settlemeyer. So uh, we can take our hat off to him, even though he's kind of a crook. Um, Anton Dreyer, I'm mentioning here, mentioning here um, is, is a guy who was kind of working with him. And he's the guy that invented the Vienna lager style uh, he was probably uh, one of his comrades in the, in the lager yeast steps. Um, so this is the introduction. Now I have the nice picture of the beers there in the beer garden. Uh, you can see the nice canary yellow color of the beer. It's beautiful. It's a well offset by the green leaves and the uh, light blue and, and white diamonds there. So this is what we're working towards, folks, a, a very light colored lager. Um, yeah, I could. I was actually thinking of a lecture on water chemistry, Matt. So this we can propose to the board now, and we can discuss exactly what the impacts of different water chemistries. You know, I kind of hesitated to talk about that before because it's a vortex, right? That you can go down, and home brewers uh, tend to over obsess about water chemistry. Uh, it's really not that um, not that important uh, when you're home brewing. Anyway, let's try the next slide and see where we go outside of the chat room. Yeah, water, water chemistry, that's right. It's Delco now. Um, so what's the overall impression that we get from this beer? And that's pretty simple. It's clean, refreshing, and it's malt forward. Um, and obviously a golden color, or canary yellow, even as I said before. Um, there's an apparent mild sweetness. And I want to iterate that this apparent sweetness is not because we're leaving residual sugar, but because there's um, a little bit of body in the beer um, and there isn't as much hop. So as your mouth digests um, the, the starches that are in the beer from the body, um, they actually do generate sugar. And because the hops are lower, um, remember we're adding hops, not because we love hops, but to balance the malt flavors, right guys? Right, hops are just like a necessary evil here with beer. Anyway, 
these are the bitterness from the hops is, is um, there to balance the malt, the general apparent sweetness. And these are beers that have a lower hop rate. And so that apparent malt sweetness does come through. Although as we plow through our bomb packs, um, you know, we are finding that there's more hops than I anticipated from the flavor profile descriptions. Um, so what is the distinguishing characteristic? Like if this was in front of you, would you be able to tell it from another beer? And, you know, it might be hard to tell the two that we just, that I've just had from a Pilsner, uh, but basically it's the Pilsner malt flavor. That's what we're after here with this beer. Well, we're going to use a ton of, of Pilsner malt in it. As a matter of fact, 100% Pilsner malt, if you like it that way. And what does Pilsner malt taste like? Um, well, I've described it in various ways. Not everybody knows what a premium cracker is anymore. You know, that's from my childhood, eating your premium crackers with Velveeta cheese on them. Uh, but um, oyster crackers are similar. Um, the white center of white bread is also similar. So this is, this is really the distinguishing of it. You know, it's going to have this, this distinct Pilsner malt flavor to it. And that's what we're looking for. Um, saltine, yeah, you know, the little white crackers, premium crackers, uh, without the salt, obviously, then it would be more like a gozer. Um, so it's very hard to say this beer is really that unique, except it's unique in its simplicity. So when I, when I feature what's unique about it, it's mainly going to be about the exclusive use of Pilsner malt and, of course, lager yeast that you use. And you know, there's not a lot of flexibility in this particular beer either. It's not like, you know, everybody can use different hops to different effect or whatnot, because the hops are not like part of the main flavor profile. You can use different hops, but they're really not going to affect the beer that much. Um, yes, it's beer flavored beer. Um, so you can look it up online on your 2015 BJCP guidelines there. It's category 1D. And you'll see not really a tremendous amount more information, unfortunately. Uh, it's basically a Pilsner malt beer with a low hop bitterness. Um, so let's try the next slide and see what we come up with here. Um, so we'll talk about the main ingredients. Since this is featured in the beer, let's talk about what we're getting here. Uh, Pilsner malt is, is the lightest kiln malt. It's very low color and there's fewer heating related flavors. And so you're not gonna get all of that caramelization and browning and melanoidins and all of that other stuff that people talk about with some of these other roasted or caramelized malts. Um, now, in general, they're a little bit less um, modified than other malts, but they, use, they have a reputation for having been under modified and this kind of required a decoction mashing uh, in order to extract the starches, but that's not true anymore. A regular mash should be able to extract all the all of the starches from the from the modern malts. They're usually listed as about eighty percent utilized uh, yield, um, and that's pretty much all you're ever going to get from from uh, as is uh, grain extracts. Um, there is some confusion in the marketplace about Pilsner malts. A lot of people talk about the Pilsner beers as requiring Moravian malt. Right. Well, Moravian malt can mean two things. There is a place called Moravia, um, and so it could be uh, where it's grown. Or Moravian is actually a Pilsner malt variety, is a, a malt variety as well. And I listed a bunch of other malt varieties that are used for Pilsner malts. Uh, when you buy stuff in America, you're really getting um, Harrington malt. That's usually what's made what malts are made from. It's the dominant barley in the new world. And, and your, your pale ale malts are also made from Harrington. So how do we handle this stuff? Um, if you're a, a masher here, uh, there's a couple of ways to handle this in your mash. So we're gonna talk about uh, some additional rests aside from you know, your sacrification rest to, to break down the sugars. And now we're gonna talk a little bit about handling it to break down proteins. Um, normally, when we think of a protein rest, we think of this low temperature peptidase rest. And the peptidases are cutting proteins in from the ends and giving us amino acids. And that's very useful when you're brewing high gravity beers because you're getting a lot of nutrients that are going to prevent the uh, yeast from making too many fusel oils or, or just crapping out on you during the ferment. And so that's very useful, right? But that's not the ideal protein rest 
for Pilsner malt. For Pilsner malt, you want a later proteinase rest. And the proteinase cuts in the middle of the protein. And so what that does is it gives you smaller proteins. And so it helps you a little bit with your clarity and it's going to help you a lot with your head retention now because mainly what stabilizes foam is the protein and some of the hop oils interacting to stabilize all of the bubbles from the carbonation. So that's the protein rest you're looking for when you're handling pills or malt. Um, and then with the Hellas beer specifically, one of the mid, mid ranges of the conversion rest is where you want to get some starches. So you're not going all the way up to 156, 158, and you're not all the way down at like 146, 148. You're picking a, a temperature at about 152. So all of this is noise to the extract brewers because you're going to be getting your extract. But for the people who are brewing um, with, the, with the home malt, uh, that's really important. Um, yeah, decoction, everybody who does decoction really thinks it's worth it. Um, I think decoction is a huge hassle. And so I'm not exactly sure um, it, how much can be gained from it. Um, but there would be changes in the flavor. So it's interesting to, to, if I could get a taste of some decoction made homebrew, I would love to try it because that's really a point where I've never really gone beyond a single or two step infusion mashes. So uh, after all that is said and done, um, we have a consequence of the light kilning here. And that is that there's gonna be more DMS. Um, the, the low temperatures aren't driving off all of this uh, sulfur. And so you're gonna have more to boil off. And so normally for handling Pilsner malt, it's recommended that you boil for 90 minutes. And so 90 minutes of boil means you're gonna have more evaporation. So you're gonna to have to run off a little bit longer too. All of these considerations um, are important for this beer. Um, but when you boil for 90 minutes, um, you have to think about the water chemistry. And this is kind of, you know, somebody wanted to talk about water chemistry already, uh, but we can talk a little bit about the Munich water here that's used for making um, these Hellas beers. Munich water actually, it has a reasonable amount of hardness, but it's temporary hardness. And so when you do the long boil, you actually remove a lot of the hardness. Now, um, I'm, a comp I'm a proponent of diluting the media water, you know, up to 50% with, um, with uh, distilled water. And um, it's worked out great for me with my lagers. It makes them much softer in, in flavor profile. They don't get as much as that harshness. I think media has got a lot of hardness in it that's maybe not temporary hardness. So we should be aware of that. But the Munich water is high in temporary hardness. So the beers we're drinking tonight, you know, you really don't get a lot of those hard water flavors, even though it's a kind of hard water. And that's largely because you're boiling off a lot of these things. Now, another thing is that um, you can add calcium, although I'm seeing here that Chris is saying there's a lot of calcium hardness. So the Munich water is 76 parts per million. So it'll be interesting to see what the media water is, uh, but you can actually add uh, calcium also to remove some of this temporary hardness because the calcium will precipitate the carbonates and you'll get um, a better, a, a lower amount of carbonates in there. And you will also, by the way, be able to get um, a little bit of acidification. Some people, like to buy acidulated malt, which has lactic acid in it, um, to get a lower mash pH, which gets you a more efficient um, extraction. Um, I, I'm not a proponent of that. I like to know what's in there, so I don't like to gauge it by somebody else's acidulation there. I, I don't like that kind of thing. But it's possible to do that with a fraction, per, perhaps. Um, and so really, uh, that, that there's a lot more handling all of a sudden here than we anticipated by just throwing a bunch of pills in the malt in the beer. But I think if you like, you know, practice some of these techniques, you're gonna get some of the nice uh, smoother beer uh, that you're drinking tonight. So what else do we have? Let's see, next slide, please. So the recipe ideas then become pretty simple. I uh, ripped the stats off of, of the BJCP guidelines you know, you're looking at something that's basically a regular to slightly low strength beer um, and it's fully attenuated. Um, 
and it doesn't have a very high uh, bitterness to it, 16 or 22. It's not like a half of it would be like 10 IBUs, uh, but it's still down there. It's certainly not like a Saizano, it should be uh, 27 to 32, or a Pilsner, I should say, in the same range. Um, the color is very light, SRM, so you're looking at maybe, uh, I don't know, two degrees lava bond or something like that. And the alcohol is not very high, very average numbers, right? Um, and, you know, when you look at recipes, well, there you go, 100% Pilsner malt is an option. Um, and for the extract brewers, they do make Pilsner malt extract. So there you have it. You just go with that and, and you're done. Um, if you want to add color, you can use some, you know, light Munich malt. You can use some dextrin malt for body, but that's going to come with some, with some uh, color as well. They also call it, call it carapils. Uh, it's got like a five degree lava bond color. So you have to think about when you use that, how it's going to affect your color. Um, the hop charge, well, there's some flexibility here, but these are basically continental uh, low alpha noble hops. And I list um, the top three of the classic low alpha noble hops. Um, but I am a really fond of uh, Selea, um, which is formerly known as Styrian Golding back in my childhood. Um, so these are the new names. Celia actually is a triploid of the Styrian Golding, so it's not the same hop, but it's related very closely. Um, oh, there's all kinds of uh, water chemistry stuff popping up in the chat. That's very useful stuff. Uh, excellent. Okay, um, yes. Uh, when there is um, chloramine in the water, so what I like to do is I like to let my brewing water stand overnight before I use it um, to help allow some of the, the chlorides to, to evaporate off. I don't know if chloramine evaporates off or not, um, but that would be a question to, to answer when I get on the interwebs later. Um, the, so for yeast, you're using malt forward lager yeast, which when I looked at the White Labs uh, website, you gave a number. They have a Hellas beer uh, one specifically, so I, that's an obvious choice. But the Oktoberfest uh, Manson and the summer, Southern German lager are also malt forward yeast. So these will allow the malt to, uh, to express themselves. Um, there are other alternatives, the high pressure lager yeast. I have never worked with that. Some people have systems where they can work with that. Um, that that would be something to try. And then as was hinted at, um, the pseudo lager, the Omega Lutra will give you something that uh, sort of, yeah, it's very lager like actually Sean did that something early on in my days that tasted very, very nice. You know, it, it wasn't apparently wrong. It, it tasted more like a, a steam beer kind of flavor. Um, and there of course, no specialty ingredients. So I think that about covers it. There might be one more slide with some pictures of beers. Um, yes, some commercial examples always. I think I hit most of these tonight, um, right? The Franciscaner is the only one left out that's made in the same brewery as the Palana though. So we're close. Um, so uh, that's the story about the Hellas. So go out there and get them. Uh, I'm probably going to be brewing a Hellas beer actually now while I still have temperature control because I don't have refrigeration. Um, and then, you know, hopefully it will last uh, because I am entered in the competition, but I'll brew it and then I'll get bounced out by the lottery, I'm sure. Okay, what's the difference between a Hellas and a Pilsner? And, you know, you really hit it, David Higgins, right there. The Pilsner is hoppier. Um, basically, uh, they're very similar. The Pilsner is brewed with very soft water. It's the softest brewing water in the world. Uh, and so there's that. Um, but the Hellas definitely has a lot less hops than the Pilsner. Uh, the Pilsner will feature hop aromas as well as bitterness. And so that's also something to consider. Um, and the skunk, well, that's because you're getting old beer. There should not be any skunk on either of these beers. Um, and any beer is going to lose its freshness over time. So the, um, the basic rule of thumb is that you could probably keep it six months refrigerated and about three months room temperature, room temperature being a cool room temperature, not like, you know, the garage or anything in the summer. So um, some things to consider. And the skunk, yeah, the skunk is about the light struck. 
you see in all of my commercial examples here, the Hellas beer, people are smart enough to put their beers in brown bottles. Uh, that is the most protective next to red bottles uh, to prevent skunking of the beer. Nobody makes red bottles because it contains gold. And so you don't want, <laughs> you, nobody's putting gold into their beer bottles uh, just for the sake of protecting the beer, not when their competitors are getting away with green bottles, which don't protect the beer at all. But yes, uh, a lot of the German imports, which are, you know, the popular ones are Northern European Pilsners, which actually are subtly different from the Czech Pilsners. Um, they're lighter in color and, uh, you know, they never arrive here fresh. They're really laughing stock. Um, so I, I don't drink them anymore. I used to drink them quite a bit. St. Pauli Girl was a thing back in 1978 when I started drinking. Uh, so everybody was all about that. Bex, you know, and everybody's taught, oh, this is great. This is like the, the, the excellent European beer. And of course it was awful, right? But we learned that the awful flavors were part of a great beer. So we learned to actually look for the skunk. So we're all a bunch of fools out there looking for skunky beer. Um, you know, audiences can be fooled by these things a lot. Um, I'm a big enemy of the dank flavors um, in, in, in the new hops because those were previously viewed as flaws. Uh, but nowadays, because there, there was a hop scarcity and there are all of these hops on the market that were just lower grade, everybody just got used to them. And then people started to look for them, especially because, well, they taste like pot, right? So um, people like the taste of pot. Okay, well, I've said a lot more than I intended to say in, in the slideshow. I've been trying to keep up with the comments in the chat, which are continuous, which is good. Um, I hope you guys learned something and have enough information to go and make this a really competitive uh, bombing run this year. All right, thank you.